Thank you, that's carried. Uh, the next um, item is public participation. And the first uh, item on our public participation agenda is hearing a deputation from students on item 17. Uh, and uh, item 17, we've got the next generation youth submission. Um, and it's item 17, coastal hazards um, adaptation framework. So if I could hand over to uh, our students to introduce themselves from from next generation. Thank you. I've, I can see Sean Carbell's name on there, but I suspect that's the person who's provided the audio visual <laughs> facility for you. Um, so if you'd like to introduce yourselves, I'll hand over to you for your deputation. Thank you very much. Hola, my name's Caitlin Rees and I'm joined by Keegan Verster and Hazel Vaughan. Unfortunately, Joseph Alfred and Serena Kortzer unfortunately couldn't make it here today, so, but we'll be sharing their thoughts and ideas. We are here representing the much larger group of children and young people behind the Coastal Adaptation Framework Youth Submission and the 13 schools that took part in the Climate Change Education Programme. After taking part in the education programme, 23 of us from five different schools met last, late last year to pull together our submission. Last week, we had another workshop to hear how the council responded to our feedback. Today, we'd like to share our final thoughts. Keegan, would you like to share some of our highlights? Thanks, Caitlin. We would like to start by thanking the city council for reading over our submission and putting in the time and effort to make this all possible. The changes we suggested were all received positively and we were very happy. The council has done a good job at listening and incorporating our feedback. We would now like to share our highlights of the submission feedback and show how we incorporated your feedback to suggest final improvements to the framework. We will start by speaking to the parts of the framework we like the most and why they are important for us. Hazel, I will let you start. Thanks, Keegan. We were really happy that the principles about the treaty, thinking about all ages and now into the future and nature-based options stayed the same. We also liked that you replaced four to with in the local community plans for the local communities principle and that you will ask communities to share the things that they value in their community. Keegan, would you like to talk about education? Yes, thanks Hazel. Unfortunately, Joseph could not be here to share his part, so I'll be doing it for him. We would also like to thank the council for adding education as an engagement principle. This is important to us because personally, I don't, didn't know how serious climate change was, but with your help, I now know more than some adults. The workshop run by the Council of Charlotte helped us understand the threats and vulnerabilities to our local environment. Armed with this knowledge, we are able to help and suggest ways to adapt where people live. Because we feel better informed, we are able to inform others around us. We do that through our school, we do that at our school through the Enviro Club, which is connected to our local community. Over to you, Caitlin. Thanks, Keegan. We would now like to share some final suggestions that we believe that can make things even better. Firstly, adding intergenerational to the new education engagement principle. So it reads, encourage and support intergenerational education initiatives to the local communities. And we believe education opportunities should be available for and with all ages. <coughs> Adding intergenerational also supports the guiding principle of recognize intergenerational equity issues. Our second suggestion is about the manage to treat principle. Options like manage to treat should be a part of the new education approach. We would also suggest that the actual words manage to treat are put back into the new proposed option of consider long-term sustainability. This will make sure there are no surprises along the way. Keegan, over to you. Thanks, Hazel. Finally, we would like to, we would also like to share the ways to engage with and educate the community about climate change and adaptation options. Firstly, education needs to be for all ages. This includes understanding ways to best educate people depending on who they are and where they live. Secondly, they should use different ways to engage the whole community and their interests. Thirdly, as current and future residents, any approach needs to ensure young people stay actively engaged. And finally, any information should be easy to access. Caitlin, would you like to finish us off? Yes, thanks, Keegan. I just want to check that if there's anything that you guys want to add to the presentation. No? 
Okay, thanks everyone. Finally, as a team of the wider group who aren't here today, we'd like to thank you again for this opportunity. It has been great and we look forward to working with you guys in the game in the future. Do you have any questions or comments for us? Uh, well, the, <clears throat> if I just start with a comment, that was the, an outstanding presentation and I just wanted to compliment you for the preparation and for the presentation. It's it, just outstanding. I think that a lot of adults could learn a lot from both the very direct and um, informative way that you were able to uh, make pretty substantial points. I, I'd like to ask questions about the importance of adding the word intergenerational to, um, so that we're, we're talking about intergenerational <coughs> education opportunities seems to sit with me around that concept of lifelong learning. Um, and uh, I, I guess I'd like you to explain where you started from, because I think one of you, um, I think it was Keegan, who said that, you know, I didn't know much about climate change at the beginning, but now I know a lot of, more than, than some of the adults I know. So, uh, and, and I think that's a pretty powerful statement. But I, I want to talk about how, accessible information is and what was what, what what's been good about the process in terms of building that level of understanding even to the point where you're able to to really articulate what is quite a a, a complex and and challenging area of um of work including discussions around managed retreats so i'd like to hear more about the journey okay um thank you for your question um i'll start with intergenerational, where we came up with the intergenerational. 30 years ago, no one had ever heard of climate change. It wasn't relevant. There wasn't any reason for people to be worrying about it. And now um, we see it everywhere in the world. All these kids, all kids our age are learning about it because it is important. It is, it's going to affect our lives because we're young, we're very young. Whereas adults 30 years ago, you would have never heard about it. So having intergenerational learning helps for adults who are interested or maybe worried or feel scared about climate change to learn and realize or see what things they can do to change and fix climate change or to stop it. Um, with regarding the, um, sorry, regarding any other topics um it's all all comes down to knowledge and it all comes down to everyone want everyone wanting to know or everyone needing to learn about it so that they can help um help change it help stop climate change because it is a very very serious threat to our our earth and it's very serious to wildlife and our lives and all things that are living and thriving and knowledge is just the most important part about it because it is vital that everyone knows it's very very vital and and the reason that you say that it's vital for everyone to know is because people need to take action themselves and for them to take action themselves they need to have that knowledge base yes because having everyone know it we, it grows from one person comes two, then four, then six, then eight, and it grows into this massive, a massive um, community who are like, no, we need to stop climate change now. And I can, I know multiple different, I know many adults and many children who are very keen on climate change and they're very keen on helping, helping us to stop it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Anne Galloway, you've got your hand up. I have, and I just wanted to also congratulate you three. That was amazing, and you've given us evidence about why it's so important to have youth voice um, coming through to us and being involved. I'm just wondering, have you had an opportunity to give uh, a feedback evaluation about the process that you've been involved in so that we can learn from that going forward as an organisation because obviously it's been really effective in terms of engaging with you? Can I say anything? Um, Did you um, have you an opportunity to um, provide the city council with the things that you liked about this? Yes, yeah. We, we've had multiple different opportunities. We had the, of course, the original 
original workshop where we developed the the first draft of the coastal adaptation framework and um yeah we we went to meet with sean a little while ago to um see see read your feedback see your feedback and see if there's anything else we we needed to um we wanted to change or if there's anything that we felt that could have, could have had a little reworking and i've had multiple opportunities to give feedback especially to um mayor del a few years ago with m m many of the other students around the um same problem we've all definitely had the opportunity to give our feedback um and we're very grateful to have that opportunity look thank you very much uh, it's come to the end of the, the the time for the deputation but you know we only allow t 10 minutes for for these deputations uh but i think what you've achieved in, in that 10 minutes is is more than um what some people achieve in a considerably longer period of time so look thank you so much for um, putting the effort in uh, and um, you know I think you had the undivided attention of councillors uh, I don't know that I've seen councillors so fully engaged with a deputation uh, of that nature before and um, it was it was a thrill to see um, I mean I'm getting to see it up front and personal because their faces are on the screen um, but people were really engaged and listening to you so thank you very much for all of the time and effort that you've put into preparing um, and presenting your submission today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks. Right. Okay. No pressure to uh, Ross Gray from the Christchurch Civic Trust, uh, who's here for a, um, a five-minute public forum um, on the Ing Building in 212 Manchester Street in Inglefield Lodge at 2.30 Fitzgerald Ave. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ross, for attending today, and um, I look forward to hearing your words. Thank you. I'm just asking, you should be unmuted. Uh, I think you're, you need to be unmuted, Ross. Apologies. That's all right. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yes, right, I'll, I'll start again. Kia ora koutou. These words may sound familiar, our heritage, our Tonga, defines us. It is who we are, where we have come from, and it guides what we shall become. Heritage connects us to this place, to each other, to the past, and to those who will follow us. Our heritage is precious and valuable. We are guardians of our Tonga. The devastating impact of the Canterbury earthquakes has changed the district forever. We now have an opportunity to look to the future of our heritage and to treasure and celebrate the heritage buildings and places we still have left. These words, thank you, Deputy Mayor Andrew Turner, they're yours, from the CCC Heritage Strategy, Our Heritage, Our Tonga, 2019-2039, pertain precisely to two significant local heritage emergencies. Inglefield Lodge, 1855, the city's oldest surviving substantial domestic dwelling, a wonderful story of the family, the man, William Guy's Britain, who built the house of the very finest materials. Its journey through 167 years includes a 1973 intervention by Prime Minister Norman Kirk to prevent its demolition for the widening of Avonside Drive, and you'll note the 1973 press image I have supplied. More recently, in the 80s, it was listed as Category 1 on HNZPT's list and as highly significant on CCC's schedule. Both of these are current. The destructive power of the 2011 earthquakes, the seemingly irreconcilable forces of insurance, private owners' wishes and rights, the role of statutory heritage guardians, HNZ, PT, and CCC, the difficulty of action by the community and NGO heritage groups, a tragic slow-mo shipwreck, but one hopes that all is not yet lost. 
HNZPT Inglefield Historic Area. You may not have heard of it. Fitzgerald Ave, Havenside Drive Corner is now being mooted as a possible heritage pocket exempted from new raised height limits. Inglefield Lodge should be a centerpiece. We exhort CCC to consider options and responsibilities voiced in its own Our Heritage Aotearoa. To the NG building, you'll know more than I do about the, about the current complex situation in relation to CMUA, to Kaha, the stadium, but CCC has been conspicuously quiet of late. Our heritage, our Tonga, is also absolutely relevant to this issue. 117 years of stories and commercial enterprise, a sole survivor in a decimated area, designated, sorry, designed by a significant local architect, J.C. Madison, whose commercial work is now erased almost erased from city history. Roland and Sharon's decade plus of enterprise, sacrifice, and remarkable, remarkable de de determination with many, many in support. The latest iteration, a fully planned relocation, 200 meters north to realize their dream of saving this treasure for the city's future. A wonderful city story in itself. CCC Heritage Words again. 29 June 2021 Newsline, quote, as part of the agreement of the, the NG building will be moved to another location on the arena site, south of the tr transitional cathedral. Linz led negotiations on behalf of the Crown. Christchurch City Council Chief Executive Dawn Baxendale is delighted that an arrangement that benefits all parties has been found. Her, her words, this agreement is an important milestone and a positive outcome for everyone. To give our heritage, our Tonga, the respect it deserves, please do all that you possibly can and more to ensure a good outcome in both of these heritage crises. Kia ora. And I have a brief postscript, if I may. Um, as long as it's not another item on the agenda, Ross, that's fine. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, and it's, <laughs> it's uh, four lines, uh, Leanne. Thank you. Postscript on Inglefield. Mm. Letters to the editor, which some of you may have seen, some not, from numerous, including Professor Geoffrey Rice, explaining the importance of William Guy's Britain, and this yesterday from him to me, I quote, at least they, that is you, uh, ought to buy it, as is wearers, and cover it to await fundraising for restoration. The auction is on the 14th, so you better be quick. The NG building, demolition on top of demolition on top of construction of CMUA, an enormous source of greenhouse gas emissions. You have got to be kidding in this climate change emergency city. Thank you. Look, thank you very much, Ross. And um, you know, I, I, I know Anglefield very well. Um, it's I, mean, I remember it before the earthquakes. It's a state of repair at the moment. I, I wasn't aware that it was going to auction. So, look, th thank you very much oh, yes. for yes. for oh, raising it. Yes. it. Open days this weekend. Oh, God, I don't thank think you. I'll be going inside. <laughs> no, 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 not inside. No, no. Around <laughs> no. The, <laughs> the okay. Perimeter. Look, thank you very thank much, you. Ross. It's always important and invaluable to hear from you. So, much appreciated. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And uh, we'll now move on to um, Satali Ovahi. Uh, who's the Hornby Community Activator, um, who's presenting on the disposal of the building at 151 Gilbert Thorpes Road, Hornby. Thank you. Um, Satali. Presenting on the disposal of the building at 151 Gilbert Thorpes Road, Hornby. Thank you. Who? Satali. Has someone got their... Sorry, excuse me, but someone's got their microphone on and it's causing... Feedback. Sorry, excuse me. Satali, have you got the have you got the council meeting playing in the background? Yes, I have. You'll have to stop the sound. Stop the live streaming. 
Okay, okay. hold on. You'll have to stop the sound. Oh. What? Okay, I'm going to stop the sound. Okay, is, is that right? Yep, that's fine. Okay, sorry, I, I've just got to apologies, everyone. I'm just clicking back into my screen here. So, um, yes, uh, kia ora koutou katoa and thank you, Mia and councillors, for this opportunity. And so, again, my name is Hitali Olvai, a Hornby community activator, and key to my role is um, building relationships to support people where I can and connect people. So starting off with this first slide here, I'm here to talk about the uh, multicultural centre on Gilberthorpe's Road, and these are shots taken from the back and side of the building. So my aim is to um, share my views and the extensive conversations that I've had with community groups and observed from um, wider community interests once learning that the building uh, was vacant and that we may not be able to use it. So I'll move on to the... Second slide, um, second slide, please. So um, in learning the situation, it has been a mix of um, emotions from being baffled as to how the property made the disposal list um, to frustration and not so happy as to why we were not consulted and um, what the consultation process was. And now learning that it's going through a statutory process. Um, so how did we get here? So fair to say um, a lot of questions there and looking at the assessment criteria used, um, I feel A and E apply here. So A, um, for us here in Hornby, we do not have a multicultural centre. Um, we have a growing diverse community and you just need to visit the early childhood centres and the schools to see the future changing faces of our community. And E, um, there is definitely an unmet need with uh, numerous interested groups in the space, as well as interest from uh, wider community as to what it could be used for. So there were a lot of comments made um, on social media, um, sites and newspaper, you know, really became um, hot news here in um, Hornby. And um, to be honest with B, C and D, I didn't really quite understand it. So just moving on to um, slide three. So I did a Google search on a statutory process council, and this is what came up. So looking at definitions on um, consultation, and I'll just skim through that top one there to consultation is essentially a tool or mechanism for citizens' participation, which can inform and insist, assist the local authority and its decision making. So I guess interpretation is up to the person as to what this looks like. And moving down to um, spectrum of decision making illustrated on that timeline, I feel a couple of steps were missed leading to the multicultural centre missing our radar, in particular along the lines of notification and consultation. Um, and with all due respect to the LTP, one may not know what to look for in the 300 page document and to write a submission. So going back to the definitions where it states a mechanism for citizen participation, I, I feel this was not done sufficiently and question how it ended up in a statutory process. So I mean the, the multicultural centre I would have thought that mana whenua um, te taumiturunanga should have been contacted. Um, as I understand in the initial hui, when setting it up, setting up the building, there was a strong Māori presence um, at these meetings. And also at a recent community board meeting, I appreciate that um, some members acknowledged they were unaware of the situation. And of course, a number of interested groups and, and locals we're all wondering um, what was happening to the space. Um, yeah, so I'll just move on to my last slide here. Um, and basically just wanted to share, you know, there is a lot of community um, interest in the space. There's opportunities. We see a lot of opportunities and potential in it. Um, and we'll leave with, you know, community voice 
deserve to be heard and we're very keen to retain this property. So um, yeah, thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions. I'm afraid that with these presentations, um, Satali, this is not, um, it does, we don't have time for questions, but uh, okay. we, we, yeah. we, we do appreciate what you've come to talk to us about and um, you know we, we would just like to thank you for for doing so and um, we'll certainly follow up on the on the issues that you've raised uh, um, you know and and it does highlight the the, the key issues around um, you know the significance of the scale of consultation around these uh, you know vast areas there were particular particular buildings or particular properties for disposal that were um, in that list and uh, you know and um, you know uh, yeah we, we, we do need to make sure that our processes engage uh, communities in, a, in, in alternative use before they get to that stage um, I thought that um, they had generally been but we'll follow that up and make sure that we um, if we haven't done it right this time, we'll make sure that we never let that happen again. It's a, it, the process that you identified as the process that we um, generically agree with um, as a council. So thank you very much for your <coughs> for your public forum presentation this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Thank you. Thank you, thank Jimmy. You. Jimmy, sorry, we're not, not we're not taking discussion or questions. We're going to move on to deputations now. Thank you. But where does Satari I'm have a I'm sorry, Jimmy. Yeah. Jimmy, these, yeah. it's a public presentation of five minutes. That's all it is. And I'm going to move on to the deputations by appointment on items on the agenda. That is the next item on the agenda. So sorry, Jimmy, you can raise it with me on another occasion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Satari. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to move on to deputations by appointment, and uh, we have three in relation to uh, an item that I added at the last minute to the Mayor's report, and that is the um, proposed sale and supply of alcohol harm minimisation amendment bill. And it is entirely appropriate that the first of these um, uh, presentations or deputations uh, is from Chloe Swarbrick, who is in fact um, the Member of Parliament for Auckland Central, who is uh, promoting uh, that this uh, particular bill that she has worked on um, be able to avoid the the, um, the 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 ballot, the fate of the ballot, um, and go directly onto the. Um, Agenda of or the, the, the yeah the, the agenda for the uh, for Parliament, and um, I I'd just like to acknowledge Chloe that with my background as a former member of Parliament, I wish we had such a provision where the non-executive members by majority could uh, determine avoidance of the luck of the draw. Um, I was lucky on some occasions and less lucky on others. So I'll hand it over to you and you can begin your presentation. So kia ora and uh, welcome to our council. Kia ora, tēnā koe mea, uh, mea Dalzell, uh, tēnā koutou councillors, no ira rangi, no te amana hoki o te tīpuna, i whānau mai a hau, i tāmaki makaurau, a i tīpū ake a hau i reira, no reira ko Chloe Swarbrick, tēnā i mihi atu ana ki a koutou katoa. Thank you for having me. Um, kia ora, I'm Chloe, Chloe Swarbrick from Auckland Central, please don't hold that against me. <laughs> uh, so barely a day goes by that we don't hear about alcohol harm in our communities yet years have gone by without meaningful political action, particularly at a central government level. And that is despite a lot of jostling and lobbying from local government, not the least LGNZ. I'm aware uh, that you have a number of experts who are providing evidence uh, in following submissions. So I thought that it was most appropriate to provide my time uh, in kind of setting the scene on what this proposed bill does, why it is relevant to you and why your support can help move parliament into action. So the sale and supply of alcohol harm minimization bill does two things for which I sent you a range of evidence if anybody wants to pour through excessive uh, numbers of documents yesterday. Uh, it firstly abolishes special appeals processes for lo local alcohol policies as recommended by the Health Promotion Agency, which is an apolitical crown entity, uh, very unusual for them to do that, and a number of other organisations, including the largest Māori public health agency in Aotearoa, Hapai Te Haora. 
Secondly, it implements a range of recommendations from the 2014 Ministerial Forum on Alcohol Advertising and Sponsorship, which relates to short-term priorities. It doesn't ban alcohol sponsorship of non-broadcast sport, which was, however, a recommendation of the forum over the longer term. It also uh, involves greater regulation of alcohol advertising and sponsorship, which was a recommendation of, I won't hold my breath, uh, the 2010 Law Commission report, a 2018 Mental Health and Addiction Inquiry, and the 2019 World Health Organization report. Now, there are two major types of parliamentary bills that dominate parliamentary business. There are government bills, as proposed by ministers and cabinet, which take up the majority of House and select committee time. Members' bills are the other, which get heard every uh, one day, every fortnight, after being pulled from the luck of the biscuit tin. Uh, you'll likely be aware that Minister Farfoy intends to review the sale and supply of alcohol act in the first term of parliament. This could hopefully result in a government bill to reduce alcohol harm. However, we do not yet have a guarantee of action or commitment from this eventual review, nor do we have a timeline even of the review itself nor the terms of reference. And in fact, we are swimming in reviews. In 2010, the Law Commission recommended a suite of changes to alcohol laws, including ending advertising outright. In 2014, under the former national government, a ministerial forum led by none other than Sir Graham Lowe recommended ending alcohol sponsorship and advertising in sport. In the last term of Parliament, the government commissioned Kia Ora Oranga, that is the Mental Health and Addiction Inquiry, and Turuki Turuki, the Safe and Effective Justice Review. Recommendation 26 of the Mental Health and Addiction Inquiry recommended, and I quote, take a stricter regulatory approach to the sale and supply of alcohol informed by the recommendations of the 2010 Law Commission Review, the 2014 Ministerial Forum on Alcohol Advertising and Sponsorship, and the 2014 Ministry of Justice Report on Alcohol Pricing. The Safe and Effective Justice Review echoed exactly the same sentiment, stating, and I quote, we recommend stronger regulation of alcohol. Over recent decades, governments have ignored many recommendations aimed at reducing the harm and impact of alcohol misuse. Kia ora oranga, the 2010 Law Commission Review, Alcohol in Our Lives, the 2014 Ministerial Forum on Alcohol Advertising and Sponsorship, and the 2014 Ministry of Justice Report, the effectiveness of alcohol pricing policies, all recommended, all provided evidence for a stricter regulatory approach on the sale and supply of alcohol. Much bolder political leadership is required here to take action now, end quote. The point that I'm making is that we have had a lot of reviews and a lot of these reviews are in fact self-referential because the evidence is there and it is compounding. This is an opportunity for action with an already drafted bill to have it stay in Parliament. So in terms of this term of Parliament, standing orders were changed, which the Mayor was just referring to, which means that members' bills no longer have to rely on the luck of the ballot draw. If they can get the support of 61 non-executive members of parliament, they will bypass that lottery and get to the debating chamber. That is why I am asking for your support as one of the larger councils in this country with substantial experience and especially the failings of special appeals processes. If we can get the signatures of 61 non-executive, that is not ministers or undersecretaries, MPs across the house, we can progress this bill into law without having to leave it to chance. As councillors, you know this problem intimately. You've seen it in your communities. There is a proposed new liquor retailer every other week that the community consistently have to organise themselves to fight back against. But you also know it because of the cost and the waste of time for council and the totally unsatisfactory outcomes for communities. I know that this council, for example, spent over $1.1 million in five years trying to finalise its own local alcohol policy before scrapping it in 2017. The removal of special appeals processes will allow communities to make their own rules about where and how alcohol is readily available, and as far as I'm concerned, that is basic democracy. The other half of this bill seeks to sever the tie between sports and alcohol, implementing recommendations from reviews that, as we can see, have been languishing since the early 2010s. And as Dr Nikki Jackson will show in her presentation from Alcohol Health Watch, there is in fact overwhelming public support to make this happen. I could say uh, a lot more, but I'm aware of my time limit. So just finally, uh, too often I find local government is the recipient of law from central government that is just totally unworkable. And on the issue of alcohol harm, my members bill seeks to give power back to communities and fix this. I hope that it has your support so that we can end the parliamentary logjam and finally, finally just do something that works. Thank you to Mayor Dalzell and to councillors for your consideration.
I think I could um, <coughs> frame this as a question uh, in order to um, avoid me making a statement, but so I could say, did you know <laughs> that uh, I was the um, Associate Minister of Justice that commissioned the Law Commission report, Alcohol in Our Harm, uh, Alcohol in Our Lives, Curbing the Harm, which is the subtext of it, uh, which is why I've had a passion for this issue. Mm. Regulatory frameworks that apply at the local government level, um, they, they have to have central government addressing the wider issues. Uh, and the local alcohol plans, which were initiated under that, um, the, the, the bill that actually I introduced into Parliament, <coughs> which was subsequently picked up by an incoming Minister of Justice, um, uh, you know, and with the, with the whole question of um, Parliament uh, not operating along um, party lines, but operating by way of a free vote, um, just made it very, very difficult to get the extent of the changes that, that are actually required. But I think the strongest point that you've made there, and perhaps you want to reflect on it a little bit more, is the significance of um, you know, the, the mandate that's set by central government and the framework within decision making. And then, you know, I mean, I always felt like local government, so I, I was in parliament to introduce the legislation, it's then taken over, and but even even if it had been um, reported back to a government, you still would have had to have taken quite a bit of um, effort to get beyond the the free vote and how that would be um, applied. And I think the Law Commission also commented on that before it actually got to the the full report, Alcohol in Our Lives, um, and and the significance of actually having evidence based policy in this space. Mm. Um, and, and having the courage to address the issue in the way tobacco harm was, was addressed. But anyway, leave, leaving all of those issues aside, um, the, 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 the significance of councils uh, and their communities within that de democratic decision-making framework, the ability to actually establish the way communities want their community to be, and I'll, I'll use the example of local bottle stores, where communities individually have to fight to not have a bottle store open, and every single community board chair that we're about to hear from has had to fight to stop liquor outlets going, bottle stores in particular, going into their patches, every single one of them. Yeah, kia ora, um, Mayor. I yeah, just firstly want to actually acknowledge the immense amount of resource and energy and time and organisation that goes into those community leaders organising against yet another liquor outlet popping up. Um, you know, where there are those successes, they absolutely deserve to be celebrated. But the fact of the matter is that it shouldn't be left down to this piecemeal ad hoc kind of it's situation by situation fight to try and keep the community or enable the community to basically reach its highest aspirations, which is health and well-being. Um, and I want to acknowledge you as well um, for your money no, 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 and the no, original no, introduction no, no, of, the, no, no. <laughs> of, of the law. But again, you know, what we saw there subsequently, and we've seen it um, in the kind of languishing of many of these reviews and reports, and this is my concern about leaving it to touch, you kicking it to touch and kicking the can down the road in terms of saying, well, there's a review coming. We don't know what the review is. Uh, we don't know what the terms of reference are, and we don't know whether the government's going to commit to the uh, outcomes of those reviews is that we only in the last term of this parliament had two reviews, both that on safe and effective justice and on mental health and addiction, which told the government to do the things that it was recommended in 2010 and 2014. Uh, so once again, we're continuing to see that, uh, you know, there isn't the political willpower to necessarily get this across the line. And I'm more than willing to pop the flack uh, from those lobbyists and others in the industry. Um, I think it is also really important to say, um, or to acknowledge as you've just also um, alluded to the fact that 80% of alcohol across this country, um, from my understanding, is sold from uh, off licenses. And we also know that there are massive challenges with regards to, when we're talking about the vibrancy of the city centre and other issues, that there are a number of people who do end up potentially causing those issues that are picked up by our ambulances and by our police who are engaged in things like preloading or drinking in public spaces, which are purchased from those off licenses. Mm -hmm. We also know uh, that you know multiple councils have experienced these issues of just 
is trying to put these LAPs in place and that that is a fundamental failure of central government not putting the rules in place properly. This special appeals process is an anomaly. It does not exist in any other comparable um, kind of substantial harm or harmful substance uh, and how it is regulated in this country. There's still the opportunity for other forms of engagement as is the way that LAPs are formed. Um, I'd also say, obviously, that uh, back in 2018, Christchurch City Council and Napier uh, City Council put forward a remit to LGNZ and got 95% support uh, for reform in this space. So it's overwhelmingly supported by those who are closest to the ground at the cold face in their communities, and that is local government. Look, thank, thank you very much, Chloe, and, and, and good luck to you. Um, I, I always felt that the Law Commission, you know, given the should be able to introduce legislation in order to bypass the, the, the politics of it were, and, and then let the public have their say. You know, I mean, I think that's really genuinely um, why I mean, I, I'm a strong supporter of what you're trying to achieve um, because I think that if we can just, you know, that if the Law Commission were able to introduce legislation directly to Parliament, then that would, as I say, bypass all of those, um, you know, political interests that um, stand in the way or commercial interests that stand in the way of addressing the real issues that um, create those challenges. When the police came in front of us in terms of the um, our local alcohol plan you know, the ability trying to get it through. They said their online on on licensed premises were actually the safest place um, mm. uh, under the regime for um, drinking to occur, and it's the off licenses which are the huge challenge uh, that we all have. So thank you very much for your commitment, and thank you for your presentation. You're obviously well over the issues, and um, it's very much appreciated that you could come here today. So thank you. Kia ora and thank you for your time. And I, I, won't, I don't mean to um, pass any inscriptions, but Auckland's also done it. So if you want to do it unanimously, <laughs> then that would be amazing. Um, bye-bye. And thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the next one is uh, Vote in Nikki, please. Uh, Dr Nikki Jackson, the Executive Director of Alcohol Health Watch. And so she may not have heard me say that. So, um, and Chloe, if you could switch off your... Um, video screen. You can stay online, obviously. Uh, but Nikki um, Jackson, Dr. Nikki Jackson, the Executive Director of Alcohol Health Watch, welcome. Uh, and uh, we look forward to your deputation this morning. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, fine. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, kia ora, Mayor, uh, councillors. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. And thank you, Mayor, for your leadership and your courage in, in tabling this report. As, as Chloe has said, local government, you are absolutely at the forefront of, of hearing the harms from individuals, families and communities in relation to alcohol harm. You know the impact it has on your local health services, your police services, ambulance, justice. This is a social justice issue that needs urgent attention. Next slide, please. I'll just quickly go through the uh, stats of drinking in, in the DHB region. A third of male drinkers in Canterbury DHB are what we call hazardous drinkers, World Health Organization classification of a regular uh, pattern of heavy drinking that's likely to increase the risk of harm to the drinker and to others. There are inequities, 41% of Māori male drinkers are hazardous drinkers and somewhat of a social gradient across deprivation of 39% of male drinkers in deprived areas being hazardous drinkers versus 35% in the least deprived areas. We don't have sufficient sample size to look at Pacific drinkers. Next slide, please. About one in six female drinkers in your DHB region are hazardous drinkers, but it is amongst females we see the greatest inequities in the social justice issues, that Māori women drinkers are twice as likely to report hazardous drinking, and the inequities by deprivation are profound. 26% of female drinkers in the most deprived neighbourhoods being hazardous drinkers versus 11% in the least deprived areas. Next slide, please. And you're well aware that communities shoulder the greatest burden of the vast harms from alcohol. In 2019, which is the most recent data we have available, there were 3,515 alcohol-related presentations to your ED. Now, you've got a very busy ED. And if you consider the point that um, a greater proportion of alcohol-related presentations are triage as category one, which is life-threatening compa compared to other ED presentations, we know that ED presentations for alcohol have longer hospital stays. 
and obviously uh, have huge cost implications, but also verbal and physical abuse to staff. We know the impact of alcohol on family violence. 41% uh, of frontline police staff are spent on family harm, and over a third of those incidents involve alcohol, and family harm incidents are predicted to be increasing year upon year. But we know the other harms around violence, crime, road death, injuries, child maltreatment, alcohol abuse and dependence, poor mental health, suicide, dementia, cancer, heart disease, stroke, FASD, just to name a few. Next slide, please. The biggest drivers of alcohol harm in our society are these three evidence-based strong determinants, price, advertising and availability. And this is a concern in our environment at the moment that alcohol is more affordable than ever before. Advertising is ubiquitous and uniquely targeted through algorithms and alcohol availability is high and even available from the comfort of your couch. And it is these risk environments that are disproportionately concentrated in our most deprived neighbourhoods, including in the Canterbury region. So we need to think about the environments that we need to change to support people in Canterbury and the wider Aotearoa to reduce their drinking and to, and to experience you know, amazing physical and mental health benefits. Next slide, please. So the private members bill seeks to address two of these strong evidence-based drivers of alcohol use and harm to change our environment on a permanent lifelong basis. It addresses the availability. It addresses the advertising of alcohol through alcohol sponsorship of sport. Next slide, please. Now, it's important you've talked already this morning about the intent of these liquor laws in the explanatory statement was to improve community input into local alcohol licensing decisions by having local alcohol policies, by having district licensing committees to determine decisions on licensing. And then actually those local alcohol policies were actually enabled in November 2013. So this is 3,062 days ago. So where are we today? Next slide, please. The green areas are the adopted local alcohol policy. So 41 of 67 territorial authorities have got this across the line. But because there's no LAP in Auckland, Hamilton, Wellington and Christchurch, only 35% of Aotearoa are covered with a local alcohol policy. So this is eight years after they were enabled. This is because the majority of LAPs have been appealed by the supermarkets and by bottle stores. And those that have made it through across the line to be adopted have generally resulted in watered down policies that don't reflect the community wishes that were submitted on in the draft local alcohol policy. Next slide, please. So as uh, MP Coach Warbrick has already discussed, there was 95% uh, of the sector supporting amendments to our act so that LAPs could more accurately reflect local community views and preferences. And I'm sure that would still uphold today. Next slide, please. And as the MP said, this leaves the onus on communities and as I've heard from your community boards to hold the line to stop the growing increase of proliferation of alcohol availability. And absolutely right, 80% of alcohol is now sold from off licenses. And when I downloaded the three most recent year reports from the Christchurch District Licensing Committee, you can see that no on licenses were refused. Only two off licenses refused in the last three years. And of all license renewals, ons and offs and clubs, only two license renewals were refused. This has not made licenses harder to get and easier to lose. Next slide, please. And we've seen this in, you know, even in the media this week, time and time again, communities struggling to just hold the line in relation to alcohol availability because there's no LAP in place or there's no strong national legislation to stop the proliferation of alcohol availability in our communities. Next slide, please. And so the other element of the private members bill is around alcohol sports sponsorship. And you'll be aware that many of our elite teams broadcast sport are sponsored by alcohol companies. Although many, com many teams no longer have it on the front of jumper, which is, which is great to see, increasingly we've seen alcohol companies using the digital media to get through to their audience, which is cheap and ineffective, but enables them to uniquely target individuals. So the Crusaders have over 400,000 followers, including children, no doubt, or young people. 
You can see there the advertising of the linking between alcohol and Crusaders, uh, even having their own alcohol products with the Crusaders, or coming to events, Monty sponsored events, where you can swap your jumper for a, for a new season jumper. This is our heroes of the young that are walking alcohol advertisements. And, and I think this is time to change. Next slide, please. So we know from 2014, we don't have recent data that $21 million was spent on alcohol sponsorship, about 5 million at the national level. The evidence is really overwhelming that it normalizes and glorifies alcohol use. And although the industry says it's only about brand switching or increasing brand awareness, that's not true. The, the research shows that it's actually about increasing overall positive attitudes to alcohol in general. And this is why organizations such as uh, Auckland Transport ended alcohol advertising on all public transport infrastructure. It's why the Super Rugby Opiki teams, including the South, Out South Island franchise this year, um, committed to not using alcohol branding. We did it with tobacco. The sky didn't fall in. We can do it for alcohol. We could add two cents to an RTD, two cents to a can of beer, five cents to a bottle of wine, six cents to a bottle of spirits, and we could buy this out tomorrow at all levels. Uh, MP Strawbeck has already mentioned, we've got overwhelming reviews that have gathered dust or not been responded to in relation to calling for action in this area. We believe this is one important step towards comprehensive restrictions to alcohol advertising and sponsorship. Next slide, please. Every year we commission independent polling on support for alcohol policies using UMR. And when the analysis is looked at by Canterbury, you can see that the majority of persons living in Canterbury support government action, stronger action on alcohol, want to see protections of alcohol advertising exposure to kids. And when you add in the number of neither support nor oppose <laughs> on the fence, you actually have really high levels of public support in relation to uh, not having the alcohol industry involved in decision making, stronger restrictions on alcohol advertising and stronger action on alcohol in general. Final slide, please. So I just want to thank you for your leadership today. Uh, you have talked today already about lifelong inter intergenerational differences, and this is exactly what reducing alcohol harm is about. You can make a huge difference to the lives of both drinkers and others particularly communities disproportionately harmed. You can change the environment that the next generation grows up into a healthier, supportive environment. And again, I really commend you for your leadership. Kia ora. Kia ora. Look, thank you very much, and you've timed that um, <coughs> exceptionally well. So thank you for taking the time this morning uh, to provide us with that um, information for our debate this afternoon. Thank you very much. Kia ora. Um, Liz Gordon hasn't joined the meeting. And uh, Liz Gordon hasn't.